thank you again for being here. Um, it's my absolute delight and honor to be able to introduce today's keynote address. Um, we are in the presence of Dr. Jody Halpern, uh, who is the Chancellor's Chair and Professor of Bioethics at UC Berkeley. Halpern's research integrates philosophy and psychiatry to examine emotional influences on cognition, empathy, and autonomy, and how innovative technologies influence empathy and social justice. Halpern's book, From Detached Concern to Empathy, Humanizing Medical Practice, catalyzed a wave of change in medical education. She is completing her second book, Remaking the Self in the Wake of Illness, which presents a new model for post-traumatic growth and has begun a third project, Engineering Empathy. She is faculty director of the Berkeley Group on the Ethics and Regulation of Innovative Technologies and grant recipient and founding steering committee member of the new UC Berkeley Kavli Institute for Science, Ethics, and the Public. Her newest body of research examines how innovative technologies such as gene editing and artificial intelligence transform relationships and society in unexpected ways. And very excitingly, we just got news today that she was awarded with a Guggenheim Fellow. So it's our absolute honor to be hosting Dr. Halpern here today. And please welcome me. Well, as a lifelong teacher at Berkeley and devoted to graduate students such as yourselves, I can't think of a better place to be on an exciting day for me. And what I really think, I, as I was coming here today, I was seriously thinking, as, as my generation gets older and as the world, and I see dear friends here, as the world um, complexity, well, the world's always been complicated, right? But as we have so many challenges related to science and ethics and policy, one of my sort of more cynical, but in a way, honest things to say is that the way for real change to happen is for those of us who've been older and in power for a while to die off and you guys to take over. <laughs> but um, I seriously do think there's a transmission of knowledge, but there's really important needs for your generation to change things. And I know many of you are here. Actually, I don't think anyone would come to this conference as a scientist without that commitment. So you're a very important group of people. Um, what I'm gonna do today, I know many of you are in all different areas of science. I know you've talked about environmental policy quite a bit, um, but really my expertise um, that would be relevant to a case study for you is in the area of gene editing. So um, I titled my talk and, and uh, Lee Witkowski and I are, are partners in crime. And I just wanna make sure Lee knows that I used this as the title of something five years ago because she, she separately, we have these separate interests in this title, um, we're, we're colleagues, but um, it's entitled Compression from Bench to Bedside. And, and so bedside is very relevant for gene editing. Compression speaks to the fact that basic scientists, lab scientists like yourselves are increasingly involved very quickly in translating their work into products, med medical um, treatments in this case of gene editing, but in environmental and other sciences, basic scientists are very quickly getting involved in societal interventions as well. So there's a new set of obligations for basic scientists to see that kind of future for themselves. Okay, so let me start with my story that has to do with gene editing. In um, 2016, IGI, as you know, is the Innovative Genomics Institute. Um, two of the leaders of it at the time, Jennifer Doudna and Jacob Korn, and you probably have all heard of Jennifer Doudna, but Jacob was playing an important role with her as well, um, were very concerned because they were receiving letters from they, you know, with CRISPR was all over the press and the media, and they were receiving letters from people desperate in their, you know, from the, the way they wrote the letters with genetic diseases and their families asking, you know, tell us about this. When can we expect a cure? And there was a humility uh, that I saw in Jacob Korn approaching me as an ethics professor at Berkeley and saying, you know, we're bench scientists, we're trained in the ethics of sort of honest research, you know, not to. Um, not to change our data, the ethics of inclusion of authorship, that's science ethics. And actually with Lee and our Berger group, which I'll say a little more about in a minute, um, we did a small survey of the scientists in terms of what their education during PhD training was for ethics. And it was all that, it was you know how not to be fraudulent, how to, how, et cetera. But nobody 
in the basic sciences was being trained about how do you communicate with the public in a way that doesn't raise their expectations unrealistically? How do you um, uh, make sure you know what communities need? There's nothing like that in training for most basic sciences. So um, there was this concern that they were trained in scientific integrity. Okay. So that was really an interesting time because the scientists, like I said, there was a kind of humility in the field. And then very soon after that, really by 2016, it looked like a lot of scientists nationally and internationally in the gene editing area were becoming very interested in translation. So here we see the scientists now reaching out to the publics, the opposite direction. And by 2016, you start to see gene editing scientists attending disease uh, foundations that have funding to sort of present in a positive light the possibility of cures from gene editing. And we have a quote for a very important expert at that time saying, in the lab, we've already, we've already managed to create a cure for sickle cell disease. So as, that's 2016. So there was very promising findings in the lab, but they weren't, hadn't gone through the kind of human subjects research that as we know, can be very complicated and take many years. So there was a kind of exuberance that maybe overstated the case. So that leads me to what this talk is about today for all of you. Again, I'm using gene editing as the example, even if you're in totally different sciences, because these issues come up about how you approach environmental interventions like carbon sequestration and other things, um, which is what do scientists like all of you need in this graduate time of your education or postdoc time, what kind of understanding of ethics do you need to meet your future ethical responsibilities? That's what, that's what I'm hoping to talk about. And in my opinion, there's two different types of things you need. You need to get really um, sophisticated at ethical reasoning, and that will be the first part of my talk. And I'll talk there about how there are two major frameworks for thinking about ethics and how surprisingly experts tend not to notice that there are two and just collapse into one, and that's a big problem. So that's sort of the knowledge part. But the second thing, which is just as important as the knowledge is the motivation to take ethics seriously. And that requires a kind of self-awareness and self-reflectiveness, an awareness of how the incentives that you face to translate your research or get involved with companies or different things you might do. What are the incentives? And how is that potentially creating blind spots in terms of looking at the ethical complexity? And you need reflectiveness about what's the societal context that you're operating in? Are there vulnerable populations or populations that have been traditionally disadvantaged that your work is going to affect differentially? So it's that second set of self-reflectiveness and awareness of context is really about your motivation and your, your, aware, your awareness. Okay, so let me talk about the two ethical frameworks. Okay. There are basically two basic systems. This is pretty reductionist right now, and I'm happy in Q&A to make it more complicated, depending on what you want to do. Um, but just for the sake of argument, let's just say there's two major ethical systems of thought. And I'm calling the first one utilitarianism, although philosophers will know that's just one brand of a broader approach, which is called consequentialism. But what all those have in common, and utilitarianism is the, is the version we're all familiar with, is that it's solely focused on outcomes. And the outcomes have to do with well-being or a measurable benefit. So how can you measurably improve a certain health statistic? Or how can you measurably improve um, carbon sequestration? How can you maximize? Also, utilitarianism is about maximization. So it's outcome maximization of a well-being benefit. And it's not obvious to people that that has nothing to do with the ethics of rights. And rights and duties, as I'll explain, are part of the same thing. So things like respect for autonomy, which we practice through practices like informed consent for research, justice and fairness, which you've dealt with at the conference a lot, you know, who's left out in our society, who's left in, and human rights are all actually part of the ethics of rights and duties. Now, why do I think it's important for scientists to be aware that there's two systems? There's good research showing that science, and, well, the, the research shows that experts in general, which includes scientists and engineers, are by default, they're utilitarians. 
And this seems to be related to that when you have a certain level of expertise and you're thinking about your science or your technology or your governance, if you're um, you know, a, a president or something else, you're try, you have a focus, a specific policy outcome that you wanna maximize or a specific um, intervention like carbon sequestration or uh, reducing sickle cell disease. That expert perspective is exactly not the, the view of most people. Ordinary people, when they're thinking about their lives, which includes all of us when we're not being scientists, when you think about ethics in your life, we all tend to go to the ethics of rights and duties because that's the ethics of relationships, of role responsibilities. What do I, as a mother, own? you know, we have the, I'm very happy about the Supreme Court, um, uh, uh, newest member of the Supreme Court, and Katanji Brown Jackson talked famously about, you know, it was all over uh, the past few days, um, people saying, you know, should she have said to her daughters that it wasn't always easy balancing being a mom and being, you know, a judge. Um, and that, you know, this whole thing about, you know, what do you owe your kids? What do you owe your career? What do you owe your constituents? That's really about role responsibilities and relationships. What do I owe you as a teacher today? What do doctors owe patients? So um, that's how we, most people have thought about ethics. And what's interesting is that the two different frameworks, um, they can overlap. You can come up with solutions that, that go well with both, but they can definitely conflict. And that's actually not accidental because historically they were sort of designed to, one was designed to oppose the other and I'll get into that. So um, yes, here we are. Um, just history in a nutshell. I'll start with the lower part of the slide, the ethics of rights and duties. These are basically, this is super reductionistic, but I'll say this is the history of Western ethics till about the early 19th century was pretty much the history of, of uh, rights and duties. And you see that word there, deontology, I didn't define it. It's the study of ology, deont, Latin for duties. So the, the, the theories that are ethics of rights and duties are called deontology. And I'll just say something about that. Up until about the 18th century, the ethics in that field almost always talked about duties. Like I talked about, what's your duty as a doctor, a parent, a, 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 a governor? But with all the different historical changes after that, most of those same kinds of theories shifted to talking about rights. And what people don't understand usually is that rights and duties are more or less this part of the same thing. It's a yin yang, where one person has a right, another person has a duty to respect that right. So rights and duties can be talked about interchangeably, but we tend to talk in this era more about rights than duties. So up until about you know, late 18th, early 19th century, um, people basically thought of ethics that way. And then in the early 19th and mid to mid later 19th century, several people, but most famously Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, who invented sort of utilitarianism. And they were um, in the UK and they were very concerned about the terrible quality of life in urban environments where they saw tremendous you know, poverty, pollution, um, insane asylums where people were treated poorly, just a kind of horrible quality of life for the society. And they said, how are we gonna put our ethical energy into making a better world? So they were thinking like social engineers and they were also early advocates of the field of public health, which is my other field. And um, in their view, they were sort of the disruptors of their time. In their view, there had to be something really wrong with the same old ethics if this is the world we were living in. So they said, we've got to throw off the shackles of all these role responsibilities and just have a, the, a bird's eye view from above. If you were looking down on society, what kind of world would you want to create? And that world would be one where there'd be you know, clean water, good mental health care, whatever which is a very, it's a utopian and very important vision. But to do that, they were saying, you have to kind of not be concerned with your role, your responsibilities, but with being part of a process to change the whole world for the best outcome. So when we use that phrase, the ends justifies the means, which is kind of an insult to utilitarianism, it's actually really not an insult because in a very important way, they said, let's stop thinking about processes of rights and due process and all that and just do what it takes to get to the best outcome. Okay, so now I hope I've convinced you that there's these two different frameworks. 
just an example of how they can conflict this year. In, so Berg, Bergen is the Berkeley Group for the Ethics and Regulation of Innovative Technology, which Lee and I and others have been um, started and have been involved in here that you're all welcome to join. We have a website at Berkeley. Um, but this year, our, our program focused on climate change, and we wound up having a significant focus on environmental justice. And one of the important things that we, was, we talked about there was how certain maximally outcome improving interventions for climate change, like certain uses of carbon credits and potentially certain projects with carbon sequestration could actually create more injustice, more environmental injustice in terms of which groups would be harmed even if maximum aggregate outcomes collectively would occur. So that's an example how a purely utilitarian focus may create an injustice. Okay, so what are you gonna do as scientists now? I've just told you, this is the whole, I'm almost done with the first half of my talk, which is saying, you've gotta know this stuff, you've gotta understand and you've gotta know how to use it. And now I'm telling you there's two whole frameworks that can conflict. Well, basically we need creative people to figure out how to weave together a framework that's usable that integrates some of the parts of both frameworks. It's not gonna be completely um, homogenous or solve every problem. But one area where that's happened, where people have had serious need to integrate these approaches is in the protection of human subjects in research. So you might've all heard about, um, well, I'm sure that most people here have heard about IRBs, institutional review boards. If you're ever involved in research with human subjects, you have to apply to your your institution's IRB or institutional review board. To, and they their goal is to safeguard the ethical treatment of human subjects. And what they are basing their, their work on is, um, well, first of all, there was an act in Congress in 1974 that made it required to have IRBs and for them to approve any federally funded research. But there's also, uh, uh, I don't know, how many people have read the Belmont Report? Raise your hand if you've read the Belmont Report. Oh, cool. I actually can educate you today. <laughs> Read the Belmont Report sometime, maybe this weekend, next week. It's online, it's short, and it's a really, I mean, I have ex, lots of other ethics experts in the audience that may disagree with me, but in my view, I'm wondering what Winston thinks, but in my view, it's a really good document. It was a really well-written document. It has flaws, like it doesn't tell you how to rank anything. But do you think it's worth a read? No, it's, it's, not, it's not too bad. Yeah, I mean, and it, so it's a really, and I think it's well-written. And, and it's a pretty quick read, but what's cool about Belmont is they, they said, look, people are not gonna know everything about utilitarianism. They're not gonna know everything about deontology, but we can come up with three principles that kind of, they're heterogeneous. They involve some utilitarian concerns, some rights concerns. And here's the three principles, respect for persons, which is if the person is, has the capacity for decision-making, it's respect for autonomy. And that is the basis of the requirement to make sure that people provide informed consent. That's because they should understand what they're signing up for. They should be making a decision with a full understanding of what they're signing up for. That's a rights-based approach. You can see that, right? But the second principle, beneficence, is, is, has different meanings that I won't go fully into, but one of them is aggregate benefit. How, is this a kind of research that can prov pro provide an aggregate benefit for society? You can see that's utilitarian. Turns out it also includes the risk benefit ratio of, for the individual research subject. So it has more to it, involves some rights also. And then the third, justice or fairness is, a right, is based on rights. So, so here's a good example. It is possible to come up with an integrative framework. Um, so that might be helpful to you. And then I'll show you the framework that I use that I developed for teaching graduate students like yourselves. And I'll just say one thing about it. This is my framework. And uh, oops, sorry, there it is. And uh, the point of this framework is maybe for today, because we've got a lot more to do and I wanna have time for Q and A. I think the most important thing about this is first of all, not doing harm is actually a unifying goal of deontology and utilitarianism, not creating harm. There's complexity to what I'm saying, but that's one way to think about it. Another thing that they both have in common, I don't know if you can see pluralism, diverse values, the whole realm of ethics has to be subject to understanding the role of different communities that hold different values. 
But then perhaps the most interesting thing about this diagram or this approach is you can see that from utilitarianism, there's a direct line to beneficence or creating a beneficial well-being outcome, but that's about it. But all the other things that we're used to thinking about ethics all come from deontology in this diagram, respect for human rights, respect for autonomy, and all the things that have to do with equity, justice, inclusion, distributive justice. Okay, so that is the first half of a two-part talk. So we're more than halfway done now. We're about halfway done. And that's, that's the kind of uh, wisdom and understanding and knowledge base that I think graduate students in the science areas should develop. And there's a lot to do applying cases to this, thinking about it. But the second thing I said to you is all the, all the wisdom or written knowledge in the world is useless to, depending on the motivation of the scientist, right? How motivated are you when you're designed? Let's say you develop something really cool and you've you know, published in major journals and now people say you could be part of starting a company or you can be really important in this way or that in a public relations role. How motivated are you to think of the ethical complexity of what you're doing? Because without the motivation and the self-awareness, none of this other stuff matters. And so to talk about that, I'd like to share with you a research project that we've been involved in for, for well, we started in 2018. So here's, the, here's that project and the rest of my slides will be about that project. Okay, so um, we, we conducted 44 one hour interviews during 2018 and 19. This is again in the area of CRISPR gene editing with, and everyone we interviewed had some involvement in beginning to, or at least beginning involvement with translation. And we interviewed 21 bench scientists and 23 clinician scientists. And that's the reference to the article. And I just want to call shout out Sharon O'Hara, who is of that article co-first author with me, as well as Lex Owen and Dave Paolo. And this project was funded by IGI. And that's really one of the important things today is, is that institute, at least during that period of time, was willing to fund projects that could potentially be critical of the field. And I think that that's a really good role model for scientific integrity. So our research question, let's see, oh good. Um, our two research questions for this project were, how do bench scientists describe their motivation for going from bench research to translational research? There's been a huge, I forgot to say, there's been a huge movement. I said that things are getting compressed, but I didn't say statistically, many more bench scientists are involved in translation than used to be. And that's very true in fields like gene editing. So how do they describe, why did they, why did they do that? Why are they moving into translation? And by translation, I mean either starting companies or, speak, or, or raising money from disease foundations or partnering with people promoting clinical trials or the development of clinical trials. And then our second question, which in our view was potentially related, but we didn't know, we tried to be um, agnostic and learn, was what do scientists understand about the motivations of the people with genetic conditions who, part, who will participate in their phase one trials? Okay. So first, this, oops, gotta go with that. This is the first question. How do bench scientists describe their motivation? Why are they moving into translational research with CRISPR? And the first thing everybody said is that CRISPR is fantastic. It's affordable, precise, and permanent. CRISPR fulfilled the field's desperate need for a genome engineering tool to actually do the right experiment. CRISPR is actually fascinating because you can actually have control you can refine your tools so that it's as specific as possible. I don't think we've had that capacity before. So that made sense. They were very excited about the technology. But then people also went on to say that CRISPR showed enormous promise of producing cures for diseases. And again, this is 2018. Tools like this, with CRISPR, which are powerful and easy to adopt, should really be regarded as something that can save millions of people's lives. From the scientific perspective, there's an overflow of optimism. And then some scientists were reflective about this. Overpromising cures for diseases is something that I think academic scientists can be guilty of too. It's the nature of grant writing, right? How do we come up with revolutionary tools in biology, of, to, in biology to cure diseases? When, once they started talking about this promise of cure, and we had actually our interviews ranged from 60 to 90 minutes. So we had a lot of time with the scientists and we always had two people in the interview so that we could observe their nonverbal communication too. 
people would then shift as they felt more comfortable in the interview. And the next reason they said that they, they started to tell us more why they personally had gone from bench science to translation. Basically, everyone said translational funding is essential to do science. You actually cannot keep your, your lab funded without getting into translation. Funding is so tight, you have to play the game. I mean, we used to just be an NIH funding and, and investigator initiate, initiated. Now half of my funding comes through these industry partnerships. If they industry weren't interested, the whole field would basically die. Basically, therapeutics are where you can make the most money. And so if you're a company who's beholden to investors to try to maximize your profits, you're gonna go there. And then what we learned and didn't expect was uh, that they basically told us that company funding is necessary to get NIH funding. So our short-term considerations are completely driven by funding and money. What do the funding agencies wanna fund? Which one of those can we make ourselves fit into? NIH wants to know what companies have you talked to? Because if you say, I've talked to five companies and none of them are interested, please fund my research. I don't think so. So what you see here is the model that we, you know, pretty much came up with from this, which is that if you start with the red, actually, I, I can't read it and I don't have it in my thing, but you can all just read, the, read it yourselves because I can't see the slide. But the point is, the scientists have an incentive to get NIH funding just to do even their bench research. The NIH won't fund you unless you can show you're already involved with industry. Industry won't fund you unless you have a project that has a relatively short-term promise of return on investment. That usually means therapeutics. And so the cycle continues. This, by the way, doesn't mean that the scientists who said that they can cure diseases and cure millions of people didn't really mean that also and didn't feel motivated by that, but it's, com it's complicated, right? <clears throat> okay. And here's a quote that says what that, what that diagram says. In academia, for the most part, there's no way to get funding behind a phase one, beyond, beyond a phase one trial. And so if you wanna go anywhere else, it's gotta be something that some company is willing to pick up at some point and fund further development and eventually launch because an academic institute can't sell drugs typically. So the continuum turns into a very specific set of stories. This someday will be a product that makes a massive profit. Or if you maybe can't tell a story of this is that, if you can say this is a really small patient population like rare diseases, but it will be a rapid clinical proof of concept that this whole technology platform works we'll be able to develop other products using these capabilities that we can sell to larger patient populations. There has to be a story that somehow connects from today to making money. Okay, so that's what we learned about the scientists' motivation for doing their translational research. What did we learn from them about how did they understand the research subjects, the people that would be their first experimental subjects, what did they understand about those people's motivations for participating in genuinely uncertain phase one, phase one, two research experiments? So that's this question. How do scientists understand people's motivation to participate in early clinical trials? So this is what they told us at first. When we first asked why do people participate in clinical trials, this is what the scientists told us. I've seen patients who are desperately looking for every bit of experimental therapy. And they're just so desperate already that when this genetic solution comes out, even if there's a huge risk, they'll try it. Which is sort of like the letters that Dauna and Jacob Korn got, right? There are a lot of people who fit this description. What's interesting though, because we're really interested in what the scientists, how they think, how reflective they were. We then said, okay, now put on your hat of somebody who is some of them were already involved in launching clinical trials, but several of them were just trying to get the, there's a lot of things that have to happen before a trial can ever occur. And it could have been the INDs or the approval, pre-approvals, it could have been getting funding. So they were envisioning a clinical trial. And these are mostly in the areas of eye diseases and blood diseases, which were some of the early CRISPR targets. Um, so we said, okay, imagine that your translational projects take place now, or what interactions have you had with people who are research subjects what do you think they understand about being in a research study that's basically an, ex, you know, an experimental study? 
And this is what they told us then in the same interview. People have to understand that if they participate, they're doing it for the greater good and it will help advance these therapies. They should understand that they shouldn't really expect any direct benefit. Lives are being saved as we speak. And that's the point. The participants in the phase one trial are not there to get cured. They're there as volunteers, part of the team, if you will, to help patients down the line receive a benefit. And in this particular quote, um, and S is just the name of this, like we don't want the scientist name. So it's scientist one, scientist 17. You can see in this second quote by S1, even within itself, it's contradictory, right? It's saying lives are being saved as we speak, but it's also saying that people really aren't expecting a personal benefit. This is also the kind of thing we heard, seeking the best genomic data points. This may sound harsh, but if you're developing a therapeutic, you don't get a lot of shots on goal. You can't afford to test it in patients that have a lower probability of positive results, a positive response. That means you've got to select patients that have the least symptoms earliest in the disease where you can hope to see something. So I hope you see that these are contradictory views. These are very smart scientists like yourselves, but when they're talking about promoting funding, they really think about desperate patients seeking cures for themselves and their loved ones. But when they're talking about obligations and research ethics, they think about how people must understand research subjects that the benefits are unlikely and they must be motivated by altruism. And there was really little awareness of this dual representation within the interview or little reflectiveness about what might be going on. And to make things more complicated though, there were, I do think people that we interviewed were aware of their own lack of training or, I mean, they were uncomfortable with the ethics part of the discussion. And they talked a lot about outsourcing ethics. And they're the, they're the, these are the lab scientists. I have another, the other study that I'm not presenting is the physician scientists. So the lab scientists said, I think physicians and bioethicists should be a conduit between the scientists and the patients. So there probably are a lot of opportunities you know, for some well-intentioned magical third party to come in, someone that doesn't have a conflict of interest. So the scientists that were starting companies, et cetera, perceived themselves as having a conflict when they said that. And then someone else, actually more than one person told us, I think the FDA is a very key player here. I think the FDA has to serve as the de facto bioethicist. And I'm looking at Lee because she knows that the FDA doesn't do anything like that. And then the third person said, we have people we engage with to outsource, to put these things in place. I don't think we're doing harm where I think we can make an impact is possibly in certain fields of cancer, where I don't think we're well positioned is to make an impact on informed consent. So there's a kind of humility in this. People are sort of saying, I, I mean, this isn't what we can do. Um, so on the one hand, people weren't as aware of their contradictions, but on the other hand, there was a humility and an awareness that they need help. They need more to do this. So what are the implications and challenges? Just a few more minutes and then we'll go to Q&A. First of all, I really do think the scientists with just a little bit of prompting become reflective, more reflective about the complexity here. So here's somebody reflecting on their spokesperson role, you know, being sort of somebody who tells uh, foundations, we have a cure for sickle cell already. Um, it's the accidental role that scientists and, clini and, sc and clinician scientists have been thrust into without any training or thought or experience. And I think that one of the challenges is because we've been asked a lot now, we therefore think that we are the people who should be asked. But just because you work on gene editing in the lab doesn't mean that your insights into its implications for society are at all valuable. So that really bothers me. And that's coming from the scientists. Now the public have certainly spoken to scientists about these issues. Here's a quote from Latasha Hoskins Lee, who um, was one of the leads for the National Minority Quality Forum. This new attention from the pharma industry and research organizations has prompted individuals with sickle cell disease to express, to express concerns of future abandonment, that these potentially risky therapies are tested first in sickle cell disease to quote, figure it out on us, then go to other diseases, leaving us again with no options. So there's a, there's a, a gap in trust right there. So how are we gonna make science more trustworthy for the public while we have scientists aware of these gaps? US Health and Human Services says trust must be built on the actions of researchers, the very actions we're talking about today, not just faith in the benefits of research. 
So saying we can ultimately cure diseases is not good enough for the public. Remember the public care about rights and duties. They care about being treated with respect. They care about communities, voices being included. And it has, and we need these, and, and it has to call for shared decision-making between researchers and communities defined as those whose participation is necessary for the implementation of the research and whose well-being is likely to be affected by the conduct of the research. Okay, so um, my last two slides, how can we address this gap? I, we're gonna talk about that in the q and I, I give, gave a lot of material to you guys, so I hope you'll help us solve the problem. But um, I just wanna put a plug here for our new Kavli Center for Science, Ethics, and the Public. Um, besides my own involvement with that, Lee's the executive director of that, Lee Wachowski. And um, we wrote the grant. Both of us did a lot of writing it that got us the grant along with other scientists and folks. And um, the hope of Kavli is to engage all of you who are interested. We're gonna have an event. I might have, maybe at the end, you'll get to say it to folks on May 5th. I'll let you mention the event. But we want people like yourselves to see Kavli as a place to come and talk about these issues. And um, we also have, uh, we'll be creating funded fellowships for people during graduate school here and elsewhere to come here. But if you're here already, it could be your third year of graduate school, it doesn't have to be, or if you're somewhere else, you can be in touch with us too, because we're just forming the program. We just got funded recently. And we want people to have some funding to take some time during their science training to learn about ethics and to learn about community engagement, like Latasha Hoskins talked about. And um, I don't think I'll go too into it, but we have one particular method of community engagement we hope to support is community-based participatory research, which is, involves communities of focus as partners in co-creating research with scientists. A framework has been proposed for integrating CBPR already with clinical trials through the NIH Center for Cancer Research and for advancing patient-centered outcomes and research in general. So this is just my conclusion slide. I talked today about three things. I said, this is the things I, I think scientists need to fulfill their ethical responsibilities going forward. What happened? Okay, thank you. They need, you need, um, all of us need to learn to integrate ethical frameworks of utilitarianism and respecting rights. But we just as much need to reflect on the motivations when we have a great idea and we wanna create an application or translation to environmental or health or other areas that affect human beings. We need to really be aware of the, the, com, the, the complex context. You know, who's gonna be disadvantaged? Who's gonna be advantaged? What incentives are moving us? And we need to learn how to engage communities upstream. Thank you. So Q and A folks. I hope you'll ask questions or make comments or disagree with things. Uh, yeah, so please uh, feel free to come up and ask your questions into the mic over here. Um, and then I'll be asking some questions from Zoom as well. Hi, um, thanks, that was a great talk. So you sort of alluded to this idea that FDA doesn't really take any role for bioethics, but I'm curious what entity within either industry or academia or government you see as being responsible for handling something like bioethics. Is there an agency within government that should be doing that? Is there another, a new entity that should be created? Um, just what, what would be the policy suggestion to address that gap? Well, this, the last part, like what would I love to see is a big question. And I think that that, I might not be able to do justice to it because I'm busy trying to sort of figure out uh, like institutional level, more like university level stuff. But I would love both Winston and Lee might have thoughts about what could a new agency look like. But the main things that exist are the institutional review boards. And um, I mean, the FDA obviously has a role in safety and there's, you know, actually it's interesting in the UK, what's assessed when a new medication is being thought about isn't just the safety and the risk benefit ratio for in a pure outcome based way, but also cost is part of it too and accessibility. And so there's different things that the FDA can do, but these kinds of human rights kinds of concerns or, or are not really addressed at all at the FDA. But I, I think that in terms of what we could do, you know, we can have more, I mean, there's nothing, I think it'd be great to have another robust institution. I've thought about that a lot for AI. But um, I think that the culture has to change too, though. I mean, I think honestly, a lot of it is like with the digital 
ethics area, a lot of it is reining in corporations and, and the financial incentives that wind up tempting all of you to not necessarily think about the ethics. So um, I think it has to be something really pretty robust. But I wonder if Winston or Lee want to add anything to that. I'm sorry if I'm leaving someone else out. I just know these two. <laughs> I'll just make a historical point, which is that um, there was a decision that was made in the 1970s to really have a federated model of, uh, of bioethics. So um, it could have been chosen to have, say, the NIH govern human subjects research at all these different sites. And, and similarly for uh, regulations, you know, for, you know, ethics in hospitals. And partly in deference to the professional power of physicians, the decision was made not to do that, not to have a centralized authority, but instead to require institutions to host their own uh, institutional review boards uh, and ethics committees. It wound up having um, what is on the whole a really beneficial unintended effect, which was that it actually made ethics a part of these different institutions. So if the NIH, let's say, had given itself the responsibility of reviewing all of the research that was being done in different places, then that would have been like an external authority that could tell universities what they could do and what they couldn't do. And that probably would have wound up being a little bit more like a policing function. And actually having an integrated review system within the universities actually required each place to build up its own sort of expertise in that area. And that kind of did lead in many ways to the development of bioethics as a field, where instead of all these people, let's say in Bethesda, that were busy reviewing work that was being done at these different places, instead you had people who became bioethicists in academic medical centers and research institutions, and then became integrated into the work of those places. So I, you know, this is a really unintended effect of a policy choice that was really made more, again, uh, out of considerations of deference to existing power structures. So um, it did not have this purpose in mind, but I think it's a useful way of thinking though about how part of the challenge, kind of as you were saying, is um, if we can do things that affect the culture within the institutions where the technologies are developed, in many ways, that is more the outcome that we might want um, th that that's all, had some drawbacks as well in terms of how it's played out, but I, I think that might be closer to the outcome we want than you know a a, um, a policy response that might be perceived as external to the practice of science. So just just yeah, just I, I think it's an interesting historical sort of lesson from the history of bioethics. That was terrific. I knew I knew you'd have something cool to say. Um, I just want to say one thing about that. When I was involved in starting an ethics service for the um, Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA like 25 years ago. Um, we had an ethics committee that operated like this, that we're talking about like IRB and we had a patient ethics committee, but we were, that was the beginning of managed care. And when managed care came into mental health, it was radically financially driven and like the length of stay in a psychiatric hospital or neurologic length of stay went from like 22 days to four days in a two year period. And so the, the patients were not getting adequate care. And it was, again, the finances were driving it. So I insisted for running the service that I also have an organizational ethics, powerful committee with the CEO of the hospital, the CEO of the medical school and all this other stuff. And that we have ethics at the table of deciding which contracts to even get from which companies to fund the hospital and all of that. So, I mean, if you wanna do it institutionally, which I like what you said, Winston, you do need the issue with institutions or and ethics committees within institutions is their salaries and their depend on the CEOs, et cetera, of the hospital or UCSF or Berkeley, whatever. So what you need is some power at, at the absolute financial decision-making table to really have teeth. I'm gonna keep going unless you, okay. So um, next question actually. Hi, uh, thanks so much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. And I was really excited about when you were talking about um, engaging communities upstream. Um, in my experience, a lot of the engagement and educational opportunities for communities has come from uh, like groups that are outside of academia or outside of you know, universities or, and often are kind of 
in a smaller uh, sort of capacity, like student groups like this that are trying to do a lot of community engagement. Um, I was wondering if, since a lot of research is done um, in universities at a university level, and, and um, is there a good way to try to scale this uh, community engagement um, at a university level so that it's a little bit more of a holistic method and it's it's in, uh, it's at a level where um, it's not relying on like smaller groups and smaller communities to try to um, make sure that people are part of this decision earlier on in science. Well, that's a terrific question. I, I don't know if do you want to take that one because Lee, Lee also works a lot in community engagement. That's an area of specialty. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's this Cavley Center that we just started. That was our hope was to have a little more cross university commitment to community engagement across the sciences. And um, frankly, some of it will depend on fundraising and what we can do because it's expensive, like see money again. Um, but I think that there's at least a goal of having more, more systematic commitment at the university level. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Joe Rashada. Um executive director of the Native Biodata Consortium from the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. I met Jody a couple of years ago for a CRISPR conversation. This is a long question, so you don't have to answer the whole thing. Um, <laughs> but your last, your answer about institutional review boards at universities and whether or not that constitutes a bias um, is what my question's about. So those of you that know, when you take the city training, you take the city training in lots of different places, sometimes at your own university, or sometimes you can go to a third party city trainer. And uh, I'm at Johns Hopkins right now, and I took the city training with them, and it was different. It was different than any other city training I'd ever been to before. And mostly because when you answered something wrong, they gave you like a little history of why your answer might have been right. So the changes to the common rule, and they even like kind of led you like uh, lots of ethicists thought this was a bad change kind of thing. And uh, they talked about how in the very recent past, there was a call for IRB overhauls because not all IRBs are constituted the same. They're not all the same expertise level. They're not all the same sort of political bent. And where I'm from, North and South Dakota, those IRBs are definitely not on the sides of tribes. So um, the little comment from the Hopkins city training um, had remarked on some of these changes and that there was an overhaul and that um, to try and prove the IRB system and that basically it didn't work and it, it needs to be overhauled again. <laughs> At least that was their opinion. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking sort of about indigenous data sovereignty because Western ethics are always based on an outsider insider kind of position. So like uh, for Nuremberg, it was the Germans against the Jews. And for Tuskegee, it was white Americans against black Americans. And so sometimes um, Western ethics are used as a, as a cudgel against native researchers and native governments. Like you have to do these things this way because that's how we do them. Not realizing that the context is completely different. I mean, Yes, it's possible for an indigenous government to hurt its own people, but it's not very likely. And even if that were the case, the rules still have to be different when you're, when you're looking at your own people instead of looking at a, at a group that's somehow separated from you. So all of that to ask, how do you feel about the, the adequacy of the IRB system? Yeah, well, th thank you. It's good to see you. I think that the, um, you can see my talk had some very different aspects, but the reason I made sure to go into community engagement was because it's in a way a missing part of the IRB process. The IRB, um, IRBs are required to have one community representative. And often that person is like a professional patient or a professional person who has been part of IRB so much that they think like the other, they're probably utilitarian because I just told you experts default to utilitarianism. So there's not that kind of community deep engagement through the IRB process. There's nothing about the IRB process that requires that. So I don't think the problem solved at all. And we have a lot of examples of that. One of the cases I teach in my public health ethics graduate course is the Havasupai case where um, local, tri local um, tribes were given the idea that their, their genetic information would be used to help diagnose things like diabetes. 
and then it was used and publicly um, used. You might have covered this at the conference already because you've had some interesting things at the conference already, but it was used not only to look into things like schizophrenia, et cetera, which were not something that the, the Havasupai um, elders had represented as on the table. And also even to look into like why the medical people did this, I have no idea, the legacy of what, I mean, when the DNA had evolved, which actually undermined some of the beliefs about the land that the people were living on. So it's like one of those, you know, horrible cases of like abuse of a whole group of people. And there's many of them. So I think the need for community engagement is just unquestionably an unmet need in developing that structure, basically. Um, thank you. So who else? I don't know what time it is. I have to make sure you get to your snacks and drinks at 5.30. What time is it? Oh, we still have, yeah. Okay. About 12 we, minutes. We have time. Um, so I have a question, on, a couple of questions on Zoom. Um, so one of our attendees asks, how do you counter the logic of if I don't develop, you know, this X potentially harmful technology, then someone else will? I'm trying to be respectful. <laughs> you know, it's a very interesting difference between utility. It's a, that, because that phrase is utilitarian. It's not deontological at all. And remember, I said if you're not thinking in both both systems, you're not doing your job. Because utilitarianism just says all I'm responsible for is whatever ultimate outcome, right? So you could say, look, someone worse than me is going to do it and it's going to be even worse. That's the outcome. But deontology or rights and duties say, I owe other people respect. I owe people treating them fairly. It's an obligation that falls on me as an agent. So, you know, I mean, I could say right now there's murder going on, as we know, all over the world. So murder is going to happen. Why don't I do it? I mean, it just I, it's hard to really um, overstate how much that is a very narrow way of thinking. I, I'm, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but I think I think that the um, it's very common, but it's utilitarian. And, and it is true. It is true. Bad things will happen. I should be careful because I think it's a sincerely asked question because I have seen very serious, morally, um, really serious people think about that in certain contexts. I mean, there are contexts where if you can control an activity more than someone else, you might be able to make it safer. So I guess it can have real complexity, the question. Um, I'll ask one more question from Zoom. Um, so one of our attendees says, following up on the question about university level engagement, um, they're curious to know whether any efforts are being made to create a national level standard for integrating bioethics into high school science education and if that might serve to change the culture of distrust in science, even though even if those outside the field are engaged in understanding the, the science ethics. Well, I, you, do you want to do you want to speak to that? <laughs> I mean, I know IGI has been involved in some of that. I mean, I don't know of a national or Winston. I don't know of a national um, well funded uh, prospective activity, but I know that educating people at the high school level is where it's at. Many of us think that that's really important. Um, so I think it's a great question. Um, thanks for a great talk. Um, so I think it's kind of a given that many people in the US uh, maybe don't have a, a really deep understanding of sort of how science works at, at this high level, particularly biomedical uh, science. Uh, I think that one, one takeaway from this is that, my gosh, money has a real big influence on how biomedical research and how science in general works. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk about like the role of talking about that in engaging communities and how that intersects with sort of how people think about scientists and trust scientists. Because that's a, that was a very clear takeaway for me is that my gosh, even the scientists will admit money is a big role in how, how we're doing this. Well, you know, it's really a great question because Part of me, like many of you, I'm sure, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to project my values onto this group, even though I just said that you have to respect the diversity and the pluralism of all of us. But um, I have found the anti-science, anti-truth moves in the US really, really distressing. And we see that with COVID, et cetera. So on the one hand, I don't want to be involved in campaigns to make publics more distrustful of scientists, right? Like, I don't think that is what this country needs right now. 
But my intuition, and we hear it in some of the community engagement, like Latasha Haskins' quote and other things, is that publics already know that money is involved in science, that communities and publics already know that. And so if scientists could be more reflective and aware and address it in more responsible ways with the public, that could gain trust, actually. But I don't really know um, what the outcome of that would be. And I don't know if other people have thoughts about that. Uh, we have one more question on Zoom. Um, so you briefly mentioned AI ethics earlier. Do you think we should have a separate regulatory body for AI ethics or something that's more like an IRB and whether it should be within institution or, or outside body? Well, I've written about some things like IRBs for AI companies, et cetera, but, but the, key, the key thing is how much can companies self-regulate given, again, the way that the digital marketplace is operating. So I think that we definitely, I think we need, what we do, so again, the whole IRB thing started with a legislative action by, by Congress in 1974, requiring institutions to review human subjects research. That happened in biomedical research. And as Winston said, then we have a federated system of IRBs, but that has to be required by law, it wouldn't work. We don't have anything like that. So we need national federal law to do something about AI, but whether it would be best, I think Winston gave a very compelling case for it not just being top down, but I think that it can't just be companies regulating themselves because they spend so much money on lobbying. The same companies that say they're gonna regulate themselves then spend a ton of money undermining the regulation. So it has to be something, you know, it has to be something that's got teeth, but that is also potentially federated enough so it's a very interesting question. But we need legislation nationally to even make anybody take that seriously. Anybody else in the room? That's great. I think that if nobody else has a question, it's time to party, right? <laughs> I'll let Nicholas take over.